a very good morning dear students let us discuss with the ent segment the first mcq i have given on chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps the first mcq which is expected in your upcoming neat examination nasal polyp which hypothesis which theory explain the nasal polyp it is bernoulli's principle the mcq was there two years back bernoulli's principle explained the nasal polyp what is bernoulli's principle any obstruction in the nose if there is any obstruction in the nose, it can be hypertrophic rhinitis, it can be sinusitis, it can be benign tumor malignancy. Any abnormality in the nasal cavity can lead to nasal polyformation. Now, what I am asking you, okay, if the patient is suffering from chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp, which of the following medication is effective for reducing the size of the nasal polyp is a nasal steroid spray. So, out of the four options, the best option will be the a option the steroid spray have been proved beneficial in reducing the size of the nasal polyp associated with chronic rhinosinusitis antibiotics no they will will be the treatment for rhinosinusitis but not for the treatment for <coughs> nasal polyp now i have given you one option what is gofensin this is a use in cough again is not a is not a proven drug for the cough but it helps L to clear the low respiratory tract it is not recommended in the age less than six years this is an important mcqs related with the d option <laughs> Clear. so the nasal polyp with chronic sinusitis just remember the right answer will be here a option that is nasal steroid spray now next point steroid anti-allergic these are the first line of treatment for it model polyps it model polyps many students must be asking a query yes so why not antibiotics why not the b option is the right option Entroconal polyp have the infection now the patient is suffering from chronic rhinosinusitis so it is more bilateral more chance of bilateral so nasal polyps if i am talking about the polyps associated with chronic rhinosinusitis the more chances will be off here it model polyps so i will be going for nasal steroid spray steroid anti-allergic what are the indications like one is your it model polyp one will be your allergic sinusitis clear so in these cases but in antroconal polyp we never use <coughs> anti-allergic or steroids clear coming on the next mcq question number two one of the nicely formatted question of a typical neat question 38 year old female with olfactory loss olfactory loss for one month after a severe upper respiratory tract infection like even in covid the patient will may have anosmia so their patient is having upper respiratory tract infection leading to loss of smell the patient is disturbed by a constant foul smelling order from the right side now just try to learn this point the patient is having olfactory loss but she is complaining of constant foul smelling from the right side what we which word is used we use the word phantosmia phantom limb you must have read in physiology phantom limb phantosmia there is no stimuli but even then the patient is getting a disturbance patient is disturbed by the constant foul smelling we use the word phantosmia just remember they can ask you the term phantosmia it is again from the phantom limb so the to under which of the following will we advise to the patient to undergo a craniotomy and resection of the olfactory bulb but even i have not read any chapter of ent i will rule out this option i will not go for this radical surgery so option a is ruled i will be trying to use this question to teach you okay how to proceed even if you don't know the topic try to attempt the mcq to start the gabapentin to decrease the severity of smell yes it can be one of the option to use saline drop and wait for smell to diminish over time and to undergo endoscopic resection so it means that b c d can be the right option out of these b c d what you will choose to undergo endoscopic resection endoscopic examination word if is there it can be a true statement but endoscopic resection in the first go the patient is coming to you with some olfactory disturbance and you are going for all endoscopic resection again is sort of radical i will not go with the option d in the first go so option will be either we can go with the b or c and the what is the best option we start we start with cleaning the nasal cavity with saline drop like if just if you compare this topic with the atrophic rhinitis we clean the nasal cavity with alkaline solution so it's the first step what we do we clean the nasal cavity and clean and this smell the <coughs> we will 
wait for the symptomatic relief in the patient. So among the option, this is C option is the best option. So A and D can be easily ruled out. B and C slightly confusing. Typical last neat MC neat question bank where it was difficult to rule out the last two choices. So option C is a better choice. Question number three: Tympanosclerosis, as shown in the image, tympanic cavity is here. Middle ear is a common clinical pathological condition of the middle ear cleft. Yes, he the examiner is giving you some information. Examiner is giving you a slide. Then he is asking which is the most commonest site of intratympanic sclerosis. So always remember the most common site is always malleus. Just remember malleus followed by incudomalleus joint followed by stapes. So what is the order? The answer will be the option A. Malleus will be the best option. The order is most commonly is your malleus is involved followed by incudomalleus joint followed by step is and finally will be on permontory and if the examiner mention if examiner mention which of the following are the sites on permontory if he specify among four malleus incudomalleus then step is permontory on permontory one the first is here step is oval window Oval window is the first common site, sub fallopian just below the area below the fallopian canal and upper permontory sites. These are the important areas on permontory. Clear? So can I can I twist this MCQ? Can I change the question? Which of the following is not a site? If examiner asks you which of the following is not a site of intra tympanic tympanosclerosis. So just remember among these four options which is not a site will be your stapedius tendon is not a site so this mcq is the old mcq of your neat examination they used to ask which of the following is not a site i have asked you in this grand test which is the most common so answer will be malleus option a will be the best option mm. coming on the next one <coughs> along with the middle turbinate and middle meatus which is the most common site for inverting papilloma inverted papilloma it is inverted papilloma which is the most common site for inverted papilloma inverted papilloma is coming from the lateral wall in the area of middle meatus middle turbinate now, examiner is asking which sinus is involved obviously it grow laterally so it is going laterally it will be invading the maxillary sinus what are the worth remembering point it is a age more than 40 years it is common in male or female if you compare but squamous cell carcinoma and inverted papilloma both are common in male so how you differentiate i hope everybody after dvt session everybody is master of these basic concepts which we have covered in a nice way max uh, how you differentiate squamous cell carcinoma in squamous cell carcinoma when the tumor is growing laterally into the maxillary sinus it will damage all the walls of the maxillary sinus but inverted papilloma all the walls of maxillary sinus will be intact will be intact <laughs> Coming on the next MCQ, question number five. Again, typical INICT neat MCQ. Five year. I will just I have what I have done. I have highlighted all the keywords, which are the important points. Patient is coming in the emergency department. It means the patient is in distress. Clear with a respiratory distress, high grade fever. If I read first two lines and I have revised the notes more than five times, I will say this patient coming in emergency, larynx patient, respiratory distress with high grade fever the first option come in my mind is your epiglottis involvement epiglottitis can be a possibility there is no past significant history exam is just wasting your time by writing the, these few points no, don't waste your time on these unwanted history points clear so the patient is having difficulty in breathing yes jump on the keywords tripod position the word tripod is mentioned <coughs> patient is having muffled voice and when you touch the larynx, there is some tenderness. Again, the diagnosis, tripod position, thumb sign, they are going in the favor of epiglottitis. Patient, the examiner also is giving the history. The patient is not reported that she has received only some of the childhood vaccine. It means, again, the examiner is taking you to a clue of epiglottitis. Properly vaccinated, it is streptococci. Not vaccinated, we go in the favor of H influenza. So they can be again the multiple clues going in the favor of epiglottitis. ENT MCQ, respiratory distress, high grade fever, toxic patient, thumb sign, tripod position, you're going for epiglottitis. They can use the word swan neck position, swan neck appearance play so now what is a flow chart just try to learn better this mcq will help you in upcoming examination 
respiratory discomfort if the patient is coming with a respiratory discomfort the first option obviously even if i cannot make a diagnosis i will go for one important point i will first go for the safe airway this is the best answer clear now we can make multiple mcqs on this same topic so i will discuss this flow chart with you so first i will secure the airway i will admit the patient in icu where anesthetist is there if their patient land up in any emergency I should be in a position to intubate the patient. Am I understood? So without before starting IV antibiotics, always remember the golden rule of epiglottitis. We have to admit the patient in ICU. Clear? Now, then I will go for immunization. A patient, the status, what is the history of immunization? If the properly immunized, epiglottis is enlarged, thumb sign is visible. I will treat for epiglottitis. If is not properly immunized, then I will go for again examination of the larynx and pharynx. If epiglottis is not enlarged, epiglottis is not enlarged, I go for, I treat for the croup. And if examination enlarged, epiglottis is there, I have, will treat again for epiglottitis. Clear? So this flowchart may help you to crack many clinical vignettes on the same topic. Clear? So the answer will be airway management. What are the other important points? Streptococci is the most common. Treatment will be IV antibiotics. Never give any painful stimulus, any painful stimulus to the patient of epiglottitis. Clear? Yes, let us start with the next MCQ. Which of the following is used as a medical treatment in the management of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma? So, beta, expect one MCQ from this topic. Angiofibroma, very important for your upcoming NEET examination. Which is the key word for this topic? 14-year-old boy. If the MCQ, if the examiner use the word 14-year-old boy, testosterone-dependent tumor. Because it is testosterone-dependent tumor, we can give hormonal therapy. We can give chemotherapy before surgery. So, what are the keywords? Let us complete the keywords first. 14-year-old boy, testosterone-dependent tumor. Most common site is phenopalatine foramen behind maxillary sinus, pterygopalatine fossa. And the medial to pterygopalatine fossa is your sphenopalatine foramen. If you go in the simple anatomy, this is your nasopharynx. And lateral to nasopharynx is pterygopalatine fossa. And the junction between these two is your sphenopalatine foramen. Most common site. Because sphenopalatine foramen is involved, it is dumbbell-shaped tumor. We call it as dumbbell-shaped tumor. Okay? Which is the important radiological finding for this topic? Holman Miller sign. On CT examination, you will see the posterior wall of maxillary sinus bending down. We call it as Holman Miller sign. Clear? Treatment of choice is surgery. But rule of the game, rule of this angiofibroma, never take biopsy. Is a bag of blood. So if you take biopsy, patient will bleed, bleed, bleed till death on table. So never take biopsy of this patient. Clear? Biopsy contraindicated in this patient because is a tumor of blood vessel but before surgery always remember we go for radiotherapy we go for chemo we go for hormonal therapy we go for embolization why to reduce the size of the tumor to reduce the size of the tumor we go for radio chemo hormonal and flutamide is a proven drug to reduce the size of the tumor to reduce the size of angiofibroma they can ask you which artery we embolize we go for internal maxillary artery in apistaxis it is sphenopalatine in angiofibroma internal maxillary artery behind maxilla internal maxillary artery you can remember in this way i have given you one option gamma knife radiation gamma knife radiation which mcq of ent acoustic neuroma if the patient deny for surgery patient say i'm not interested for surgery i go for gamma knife radiotherapy clear coming on the next mcq little bit difficult which ossification center give rise to tagment tympana and tagment mastoid so this, what what the word tagment mean Tag, tagment means roof roof of the middle ear and roof of the mastoid what is the contest of the topic contest of the topic is csf atoria csf coming in the middle ear spontaneous not because of trauma right. so we have to learn the ossification center we have four ossification center in the temporal bone out of which two important which are responsible for the roof part is squamous and the petrus are the squamous and the petrus just remember this point is the squamous and the petrus part so temporal bone congenital defects we are talking about the roof of the middle ear roof of the mastoid four ossification centers are there one is squamous one is mastoid tympanic petrus bone 
in the roof of the middle ear and mastoid they are formed by petrous bone and the squamous bone so answer will be d option clear answer will be d option so clear so better in this mcq the answer will be d option coming to the next one which portion of the facial nerve is involved in the pathophysiology of bell's palsy so first of all we should be confident of the important mcq related with the bell's palsy success rate of bell's palsy is 85 percent clear what the importance of 85 noise induced trauma who guideline it is 85 decibel maximum limit of the sound in industry is 85 patient should work eight hours in a day five days in a week and third mcq with number 85 is your bell's palsy clear success rate now what is the treatment option what treatment we prescribe in a patient of bell palsy we start with steroids we start with steroids we go for a cyclovir why we use this antiviral because we suspect herpes infection we should give a cyclovir her antiviral within first three days so what is the importance of this work number three days if the patient come within three days success rate will be 85 percent if patient is coming on the ninth day even then i prescribe because you need people they give the question patient is coming after one week will you prescribe only steroid or steroid with a cycle i will prescribe both success rate will not be so good but we will not miss this antiviral along with this we give b complex we give b complex and we give physiotherapy for three weeks if the patient is not responding for three weeks what does it mean it means this patient is not idiopathic is not bell's palsy is we have to search for the cause and how we search for the cause we search for the cause by electrophysiological testing electrophysiological testing of the facial now what we see on the electrophysiological testing we see whether the nerve is degenerated or no if nerve is degenerated we will go for surgical decompression this flow chart will help you in clinical mcqs of facial nerve and if facial nerve is normal there is no nerve degeneration i will repeat the same treatment so this is a treatment part of bell's palsy now coming on what i am asking which part of the facial nerve is involved so the part which is the thinnest part the part which is the thinnest part the part which is the shortest part will be involved so it will be labyrinthine part how many parts we have we divide the facial nerve into three parts from pons up to brainstem is your intracranial from brainstem to stylomastoid foramen is your intratemporal of extracranial intratemporal of extracranial and what is outside stylomastoid foramen this is extratemporal of extracranial so we have three parts better. just close your eyes do imagination from pons to brainstem intracranial from brainstem to stylomastoid foramen intratemporal outside extratemporal and this intratemporal this intratemporal part is further divided into four parts labyrinthine so the first one sir, is meatal within the internal auditory canal followed by here is the labyrinthine here is the tympanic that is the middle ear and last is the mastoid meatal labyrinthine and out of these four parts which part is the shortest part labyrinthine part the part of the facial nerve moving in the inner ear is the shortest is the thinnest so commonly involved in bell's palsy answer will be your b option question number nine the next mcq following other treatment for menia this year expect one mcq of menia for the last two years they are giving mcq on autosclerosis acoustic neuroma autosclerosis menia they always pick one mcq so this year i am expecting one question on menia all are the treatment considered destructive except even if i have not read this topic i can attempt this question labyrinthectomy ectomies are destructive we are removing the vestibular nerve we are damaging the inner ear either we are removing doing the surgery or with the help of a and gentamicin what we call it as chemical chemically we are destroying the inner ear 
so it is endolymphatic sac decompression we puncture the sac we remove the extra fluid it is not destructive as the option a b and d option so a and b d are the destructive and the best option will be c so out of four option you can rule out endolymphatic sac decompression what are the other mcq they can ask you which surgical landmark is used for endolymphatic sac decompression donaldson line is used clear now i am sharing a flow chart of the management of meniers 80% of the patient, 80% of the patient respond with the dietary modification, low salt diet, labyrinthine sedatives, diuretic treatment. If the patient is not responding, we can go for steroids. We can add PPT. What is PPT? Positive pressure therapy. Some books use the word pressure pulse treatment. This is auditory physiotherapy, but we call it as better. We call it as auditory physiotherapy. This is one of the old AIMS question, auditory physiotherapy related with meniers. We use a device to give physiotherapy to the inner ear, low pressure therapy to the inner ear. If patient is not responding, even after steroid, then we go for, we will look for whether the hearing is efficient or no hearing is a concern if hearing is concerned i will be using conservative surgery like endolymphatic sac decompression or if hearing is not the concern hearing is already damaged i will go for destructive procedure like it can be interactive panic injection of gentamicin near round window with the help of a micro wick silverstein micro wick is there we can go for vestibular neurectomies labyrinthectomies clear so these are a destructive procedure this flowchart will again help you in the examination Coming on the last question, which of the following would not be a expected location of labyrinthine fistula in a patient of CSOM recurrent cholesterol? Nice question. What is the aim of this question? To teach you a important skill. Beta, be aggressive in the examination hall. Try your best to attempt all the MCQs. Even if you don't know the topic, try your best to apply the logic, common sense in the MCQ. Am I understandable? Which of the following is not a location? Forget the word labyrinthine is giving you a clue labyrinthine fistula means somewhere inner ear so inner ear middle ear what is the junction medial wall so medial wall is the junction between middle ear and inner ear so which are the three important structures out of these four oval window permontory lateral semicircular canal they are medial to middle ear they are on the medial wall of middle ear so when there is a fistula on these three areas it will be known as labyrinthine fistula what is pro tympanum pro tympanum is a part of middle ear surrounding the et tube on the interval et tube is there and this part of the middle ear which is surrounding the et tube is known as pro tympanum nothing to do with the medial wall what is the order the most common site is lateral semicircular canal followed by oval window followed by promontory these are the three common sites for labyrinthine fistula Last need they have asked you perilymphatic fistula. This year they can ask you the order lateral semicircular canal most commonly involved, followed by oval window, followed by permontory. Even if you don't know the order, you can attempt the MCQ by odd man out. Clear? So be aggressive, try to apply the common sense in the examination hall. Strong message with a DVT with your class notes. Revise them again and again. A decent rank is waiting for you. Clear? Best of luck. Be confident in the last spell. Play the best game of your life. Revise, revise, revise. Don't, no need of touching any new thing in the last spell. Better to revise whatever you have learned in the last few months. Clear? Thanks a lot for listening to me. We stop it.